Hello, folks. We're back on the air. Sunday. Hope everybody's doing fine. And uh, today uh, we've inaugurated, we launched our real physics series. We started with the first one. And um, first installment, first video. It's about the object, what an object is. And uh, no, not good. See. Oh, you want to see? He turned the lights on me. Can you believe that? So I shine now. Anyways, we started the um, the uh, real physics series, and we hope to uh, make some inroads with that. The, the, this is the idea. The idea is to have a three prong attack on mathematical physics. That's the way I look at it. And uh, the idea we've got here is that. On the one hand, we're going to attack them through Quora. The other one through the real physics uh, videos, uh, quick videos, uh, explain a single concept, and they're going to be uh, referenced, linked to Quora, and then we'll have the YouTube Patreon uh, transmissions, and that's the idea. We're we're trying to see if we can cause a dent to this um, sleeping giant. We want to wake him up. And so that's where we stand. So if you folks uh, want to contribute, well, um, one way you can do this is by looking at the video and proposing ideas, changes, something you think uh, would be worthwhile to put out there, you know, th this kind of thing. And of course, we'll give you credit for it. No, no problem whatsoever. The videos are going to be going into the public domain, so there's, they're not going to be copyrighted or anything. You can distribute them at your leisure. And uh, Patreon subscribers will obviously get a first shot at looking at them. You'll have them there for a week and do whatever you want. Um, you may suggest changes again, uh, criticisms, uh, uh, new ideas, whatever you want to see uh, shown on real physics. And again, that, that's just our first installment. So that's where we stand, and obviously, you know, one of the uh, issues is to attack, to criticize, to hopefully bury uh, mathematical physics. We think it's not even science, shouldn't be around, but it is around. Not only is it around, it's the reigning religion in uh, so-called science. That's with quotations. So, uh, well, here's the uh, symbol for... Um, for uh, the real physics, you've probably seen it there. So uh, it looks something like that. Real physics, okay, little man. And hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll like some of these videos that we're going to be putting up there, okay. And as you know, my son's on the other side of the uh, table here. Hi guys. And we look at questions from Cora, and we try to answer them the, as best as possible. Some are irrational questions. Uh, we try to skip those or we can't answer them for some reason. <laughs> but um, those that are irrational, we give it our best shot, okay? And also we try to focus it uh, from the rope hypothesis point of view. So if we wanna give a solution like a technical solution, a physical solution, especially a physical interpretation, then of course, you know, we wanna be able to uh, uh, introduce the rope model into that discussion. Oh, real quick, what is real physics? Back to that. You mentioned it, but you didn't say what it was. Real physics, well, for those of you who have already seen the video today, it's a quick video, it's a short video. Um, probably it's going to be the longest video I have. Uh, the others, I think, are going to be shorter, but I can't promise that. But the, the, the idea is to get two to four minute videos, if possible, within that time frame. And within that small amount of time, we, we kind of cartoon it, make it into a cartoon, and um, try to explain actually very deep subjects, but that people don't understand that they're deep subjects. They're the foundations of physics. Like what, for example? Well, uh, for example, you know, uh, one of the things I'd like to do over time is the uh, key words that you do absolutely need to do physics. Uh, the first one, in fact, is object. What is an object? We need to know what an object is in physics. You can't do physics without objects. First thing that the video says. 
And so uh, you need an object, and you need to define what an object is. Otherwise, you end up like uh, Stephen Hawking in his um, uh, famous, in his uh, bestseller, A Brief History of Time. He says, um, you know, that space-time, four-dimensional four space-time is an object. He calls it an object. And as long as he doesn't tell you, you know, what an object is, he can get away with that. I mean, you know, maybe he's talking informally, but, you know, what do you mean it's an object? I mean, if you say, look, a table's an object, nobody has a problem. You say a rock is an object, nobody has a problem. But when you say four-dimensional space-time, especially this time part of it, you know, a rock plus time is a four-dimensional rock. And so you wonder about, you know, what do you mean by object? What, what do you mean it's an object? And he might answer, well, it's a mathematical object, because they have that term, mathematical object. Okay, so what is a mathematical object? Well, then in that case, you know, they usually get into, well, it's whatever can serve as a subject of the sentence, whatever we can talk about, uh, something that's used in math. You know, they can give you all kinds of uh, uh, very loose definitions, and they can get away with murder with that, but then you just got to press... One, one, you know, one, uh, the screw, you got to turn it one, uh, one, more uh, one more rotation, screw it in there. And, and what you want to ask is, you know, the first, does it have to do with physics? Because obviously if an object is something we can talk about, that's not what a subject is, what an object is in physics. You can talk about motion, you can talk about orbit. None of those qualify as, you know, objects for the purposes of physics. So you have to make a distinction for physics. And so if they're talking about math and they're just using the um, definition of ordinary speech or one that they invented, fine. You know, if you're talking about concepts, make that clear. So when you say four-dimensional space-time, okay, so we're talking about a concept, right? Okay, so if that's the case, no problem. But then he can't say we live inside this concept because then we have a problem. You can live inside a box. You can live inside a balloon. You cannot live inside love or inside, I don't know, information or whatever. If I'm speaking literally. Right, right. And, and again, if they're going to talk about, if they're going to say, well, for us, uh, you know, an object is this concept, and they give you a, a, con a concept-related definition, then you, you hold them to it, and you say, okay, fine, no problem. If you're going to talk about a concept, that's fine. But then you can't say you warp this concept, that you live within it, that the stars are stuck to the... Uh, borders, you know, to the uh, to to the boundaries of this uh, concept that this concept is expanding. <laughs> you can't do any of that because now you're you're again uh, saying, hey, you know, uh, 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 while I'm at it, I'm going to expand space time. No, you can't. You can't expand spa space time. You can, because you defined it as a concept, as love, as you know, uh, some abstract uh, concept that we use in everyday life. And so that's why the word object is very important in physics. You can't get away from it. And as you know, as I've said a hundred times now, uh, no one in the last 10,000 years has defined the word object. And you're saying, you know, that's, that's incredible because physics is the science of object. You absolutely need a, an object. And so that's why my first video was on that subject, on the subject of, of object. But, you know, we're, we've got some others coming up. And uh, among the things that I'm going to be doing there uh, uh, to together with my son here is uh, we're going to try to get in there uh, the, um, the foundations, the key words. We need to know what distance is. We need to know what location is. Uh, I think these are key words. What exists means what motion is. We need to know what a dimension is. You know, these kinds of words, I think we need to, to make quick videos for people who, um, who may not tune in to lengthy, uh, you know, uh, dis dissertations, uh, presentations or whatever, uh, or even interviews. Um, people, I'm not going to say that they have a short uh, uh, memory or uh, attention span because it's not necessarily the case. Sometimes it's a case that there is no time in this day and age. I know this because I have time for nothing. You know, I have no time to do my videos, to do the presentations, to do, you know, s some of these real uh, physics, to write the core articles. It's just, you know, I run out of time. And that's when I know that time does exist. <laughs> I don't kid myself, you know. <laughs> 
Oh, I wish I could dilate time and have more time, you know, more seconds in between them. But, but I don't have an at, I don't have an atomic about, clock. But that's what I love about um, um, podcasts because, or anything audible like audiobooks. Okay. Because that, I mean, someone said it best. They were talking about how they created time, essentially. They're using unused time. You know, it's almost washing the dishes. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Work. They have their ears open. And they don't need their ears to, to drive, for example. They need their eyes, so you can't read a book while you're driving. But you, you can, can use your ear. Book, you can listen to someone reading. You can listen to some, to people discussing. So it's like there's all this unused time that podcasts and audiobook can tap into. And that's why I love the idea of podcasts filling in that, you know, the fact that we none of us have time. It's not that none of us have time. It's just you got to make more the, time. Yeah, you got to make more time. Exactly. Make use but of time. those people who do want to see, like, because... Many many of the theories that you propose and a lot of what you talk about, you kind of are kind of visual. You kind of have to see what you're talking about. Yeah. Like you can talk about the the ropes and the thread and how they interact and all that, but a video's worth you know a thousand all, a words. Thousand pictures, which are each a thousand words, you know. So it's like <laughs> you can either yeah. talk about how what the chair looks like, or I can just show you a picture. Yeah, yeah. And if if a picture's about, if a picture's worth a thousand words, a video is worth ten thousand words. Kind of like that. A million, I think, by the calculation. <laughs> <laughs> no, because a video, remember, sometimes shows many images of the same thing, just in motion. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I, I would just multiply it by maybe 10 as a general rule, and I think that should get us in the ballpark of how much a video is worth. But the good thing about the rope model of light is that it's all illustratable. You yeah. can illustrate it. Uh, but you it, can illustrate it. But it's, it's, it's more efficient. It's, it's better at conveying what we're talking about when you just see it. Like if someone could make a video about all the interactions, well, you wouldn't have to need a single word. You just say, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, and, and that's part of the problem. The problem is that if you're going to do like a podcast, a listening, a radio show, well, you know, that's, that's I mean, we can still do that with, uh, with a rope model, but obviously the eyes, the uh, pictures, the images, or, uh, videos, uh, they're worth, you know, 10,000 words if, if a picture is worth 1,000. So let's get into physics. Okay, anything, what do we have for physics today? Anything you've been working on lately? Well, um, yeah, not, I've been, I got a lot of core questions. I, I, I've written a couple articles this week, and um, any good topics? Uh, yeah, th there is a good topic, but uh, again, uh, I think relatively few people look at the good good topics. And when I beat someone up out there, then lo I get lots of hits. But I want the hits on on the good topics, and I never get on get them on those. I get maybe, well, I get so some you, so 250, get, get the, 500 hits maybe. So you get the attention on the salacious topics that yeah. you really care about. It's like people are concerned. Like if, if you go after a mathematician, you say, Michu Kaku is cuckoo, uh, you'll get 5,000 hits. Uh, but if you say, look, let me explain to you how a magnet works, you get 100 hits. You know, And so there's a big difference between these topics. And uh, apparently, as I see from from what I'm from the numbers that I'm getting from Cora people are more interested in the superficial things they're not really into you know how does something really work you know there are people out there that do but I mean they're not the majority the great majority I think are um, Twitter people who want a quick answer to something and, and or right because we have both uh, those people sometimes uh, are into the gossip part you know and otherwise, there are only people who are into gossip. So if you tear down an icon, a celebrity, oh man, they love that stuff, you know. But if you go after, look, let me explain to you how this works, or how light works, or or how um, a magnet works, or how gravity works, then people uh, might look at the first two lines and they'll just go away. People are more interested in what Einstein had for breakfast every morning that made him a genius instead of what he actually talked about. Yeah, I'm sure if, if you have a title or whatever the question is, the first line in your uh, answer is, uh, you know, uh, Einstein was an idiot, I'm sure you're going to get lots of hits. You know, be, and people will probably just read that one line and then leave, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you don't, you don't get uh, good hits on the articles that count, and that makes you wonder about, you know, the audience out there. Um, what... 
uh, good topics have you hit lately, or what's been on your mind? Anything? Well, in, in the last one was, which I thought it was a pretty interesting article, was you know someone asked um, about the gut essentially. You know, can you unify gravity with light? Oh, you mean the grand unified theory? Yeah, oh yeah, I grand unified. The stomach. <laughs> no, 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 no uh, health issues here. Uh, the gut, grand unified theory, uh, unification of light with gravity, primarily because they want to uni unify the other forces as well. But there are no other horses, as I say. The four horses are biblical stuff. The f two forces are physics. And there's only light and gravity, essentially. There's push and pull. And, um, and in that sense, you know, I'm saying, yeah, we do have the gut, uh, in that sense, with the rope. Because the rope serves as the... Uh, medium for light in one direction and then all the ropes connecting two objects serve to bring two objects together and that's the gravity part mm. so you know when you illustrate that and people at least understand and again they don't have to believe it but if they understand the concept of, what, of the theory what you're proposing that's sufficient whether they believe it or not is you know personal business uh, but at least you explain a mechanism and you can say look I've got a mechanism you know, I've got light going in one direction outwards from the atom. The atom pumps and, and it, you know, the, um, it torques the rope. And so it's that torsion, you can say, travels in one direction. And then at the same time, that same mechanism uh, or mediator, which is the rope in this case, can explain why when two objects come together, as they get closer and closer, they have this acceleration, which is perfectly consistent with Newton's equation. In fact, uh, if Newton were alive today, I would show him that. He'd probably say, oh, now I understand. Because, now it makes sense. Yeah, because now he doesn't have to worry about particles, uh, independent islands, traveling you know, from one atom to the other. He doesn't have to worry about all that stuff. All he, all he has to show is that you know, uh, uh, all the ropes are connected, and, uh, and as they are connected, you know, they bring two objects together. I just went out of focus there a little. I don't know why I go out of fo focus. You're going in and out of focus? Yeah. I don't, I don't. Maybe the light? Uh, let's see, turn the light, see if that changes anything. Yeah, well, it got better for sure. I guess you can see me now. You, no, but you you went, it, sometimes you, you make a movement, you know, the... Uh, you think if, if people were so, um, what do you call it, hungry for a grand unified theory, <coughs> they'd be more open to new suggestions, such as the rope hypothesis. They'd be like, oh, that might be a way of connecting the two. You know what happened, uh, what has happened over the years is that uh, around 1926, uh, 1927, when they had the uh, Solvay Conference, the fifth Solvay Conference, where they decided forever and ever that um, light is both, a particle and a wave, it's a wave packet, and that it's not what it is, according to them, but how it behaves. In other words, sometimes you uh, analyze one experiment or one observation through the wave model, and sometimes you analyze it through the particle model. That's, that's how they see it. And they live with that, and, and that's when classical physics finally died. By classical, we mean, you know, that... Um, I call it rational physics. In other words, when you're doing it with objects, when you're trying to figure out what the mediator is, these people have lost touch with that, and they don't care about that anymore. They don't care about looking at the mediator. They just say, no, Mother Nature has fooled us. Well, there's no way we're ever going to understand how she does her work. And all we can do is describe it with equations. And, and this is where the problem is, because these people have lost touch with, with uh, what the tradition was of trying to figure out those invisible entities. I mean, Faraday was a guy who saw, you know, he, he ran a lot of experiments. He looked at that, uh, you know, magnets and so on. He says, you know, I want to know what's in there. And he would run another experiment, think, and try to figure out. He couldn't figure it out. But at least he, he that was his intention. And I think that was the intention of uh, James Maxwell, who came maybe 20, 30 years later, you know. And he came up with a math for all that. He, he, he presented all the mathematics for Faraday's you know, experiments, essentially. And he couldn't figure it out. And so he, he went along with what Fresnel and uh, Malo, uh, uh, the French guys, you know, they, and Arago, all these people came up with the wave, uh, with the transverse wave. 
And what Maxwell did essentially is, is describe it mathematically. He just took the transverse wave, says, yeah, it's a transverse wave. And that's what we lived until 1926 with Maxwell's equation describing, you know, in fact, we still describe them with Maxwell's equation. But what they did in, uh, in the 1920s, or in the roaring 20s, is they just forgot about the objects themselves. And they said, forget about that. You know, Mother Nature has fooled us. We'll never understand her. And we'll just do everything with particles from now on. What is the problem? One of the problems with that is that almost all experiments, you take the slit experiment, you take Compton's effect, you take uh, the photoelectric effect, you take um, uh, polarization, especially polarization, and you look at all these experiments, all these observations, and they all have wavelength and frequency, wavelength and frequency. And you say, well, please explain that in terms of particles. <laughs> and there's no way. And so they introduce the particle and they talk about the particle and this and this and that. And then they say, and by the way, you know, what happens here is the wavelength gets shortened and the frequency expands. And, you know, they go into frequency and wavelength. But I thought you were talking about a particle. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to reconcile an island with frequency and wavelength because frequency and wavelength is an elongated, you know, by, by its very nature is an elongated uh, concept, uh, a notion. Uh, a wave is something that's stretched out. And they know this, and that's why they ended up saying, look, light is so weird that when it touches something, it becomes condensed, turns into a little point. And otherwise, you know, it's spread out infinitely in every direction. So it's like they get the both, both worlds. I guess they're talking about a little uh, dandelion. You know, the dandelion, all the, uh, all the spokes end up in the center, and you do have a center. Right, and uh, and then the spokes are the elongated <laughs> uh, waves. <laughs> I don't know, and so you you get the best of both worlds. You get that little point in the center, and you get all these spokes coming out. And essentially, what they're describing is the rope model. You know, where you have all the ropes coming in to some kind of center, and from there out to every atom in the universe. So you do have this little. Uh, porcupine, rolled up porcupine, as I say, or a star, or a, a, a sea urchin, you know, all the spokes coming out, all the uh, little points pointing to every star in the world, in, in the universe, and that's essentially what they're describing. But they, they, two, they do a two-in-one. They say, well, it's a wave. Whenever we need it, we're going to talk about wavelength and frequency, and it's also a particle because we need it for that hit. We need that collision of particles. We can't do that with a wave. You can't collide waves. <laughs> it was to go through the grand unified theory. Well, the grand unified theory, uh, again, because people ask that, and they've been searching for that grand unified theory, but what have they done? They've gone into um, um, string theory. String theory is supposed to unite quantum mechanics with uh, uh, general relativity. And uh, that's supposedly the grand unified theory. But what they're trying to do is, this, uh, is to unite it mathematically. That's important. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to understand it physically. They're saying, we're just going to try to unite the equations. We're going to try to make the equations of quantum somehow reconcilable, <laughs> you know, uh, friendly with uh, general relativity. And general relativity is the macro world, world of the big. And quantum mechanics, the world of the small, the micro world. That's weird that they have two and different uh, sets of laws or rules for. And they do. When they're both in the same. No, no, it's realm. it's worse. It's worse. We're all in the same reality. It's worse. It's worse because for the for the world of the big, they have the equations, Einstein's field equation. But for the world of the small, they have no equation. They can't figure out gravity at the at the quantum level. And that's what string theory is doing. They say, oh, we got the solution here. We're going to go into brains and, uh, and strings and brains and all, this, all these words that they've invented for string theory, all these concepts. Yeah, how does one the that, string theory unite the two? <laughs> well, what you, gotta, no, what you got to try to understand is conceptually what these people are trying to do. Uh, general relativity is accepted as a gravitational theory. But again, uh, quantum mechanics has no gravitation theory whatsoever. And so they say, okay, so, so how do we quantize, quantize? How do we quantize space-time? And, and there's two things here you got to keep in mind. The first one is that space-time is already quantized. What is space-time? Space-time is the set of all points. 
that makes space-time. And you say, what's a point? Well, this, a point is an event. An event in space-time is called a point. So you, you have all these events, right, in space-time, all these little dots, which are, you're supposed to think of them as locations at the same time as motion, because we're talking about events. So there's something happening there, but it's at a point, because it is a given point in time. Okay, and so we add all these little points, and that makes space-time. So space-time is already quantized in that sense, okay? So we can't get away from that. And so what are these people trying to do? Well, they're saying, let's invent some equations that can unite, you know, the particle nature, the point nature of quantum mechanics with a spreadsheet, with a canvas of general relativity. And so they're trying to quantize they call it quantizing space-time they're saying okay we got the sheet we got this uh this canvas okay but what we're trying to do is now we're going to get the equations because they're all about equations we're going to try to create an equation for one of those points in space-time one of those points is going to be the quantized version of space-time and they're going to try to explain or describe with that how the sheet is made and therefore how gravity works not only at the macro world but if you come to that point we can explain that how gravity works at that point as well and that's what they can't do yet they have not been able to do that yeah from a uh, mathematical point of view that was really confusing it's a little confusing but you got to understand that quantum is again quanta uh, talking about a quantum little point little dot zero dimensional particle but that particle is a location in space-time so it's a location what's at that location an event <laughs> okay so you get all these events they make up the, the sheet of space-time all right? these happenings all these happenings all these um uh phenomena it's a, it's a, it's a sheet <laughs> of happenings it's a sheet of uh events of happenings of phenomena uh actions, verbs. Yeah, we got it. Okay? And all these verbs just occupy one point because it's one point in time. <laughs> it oh, happened at 2 o'clock okay. and 1 minute and 1 second. That's what when it happened. And how does that... Um, like a collision, maybe. But how does that explain... How does that unite light and, and gravity? Uh, well, um, right now they're just trying to unite gravity. But see, space-time and... Uh, General wait, wait, wait. Is grand, a grand unified theory is an attempt to unite, mm -hmm. to unite light and gravity, or not quantum, only, or, or, not or only, general also relativity and quantum, both, both. Okay. Uh, uh, from a quantum point of view, not only light and gravity, but also the gluon, which is what keeps the quarks together, and also the um, uh, weak force. Okay, but they're they're not so concerned about those. They're mainly concerned about you know the. Uh, uh, gravitational force because under uh, quantum it's a force and they're also trying to um, uh, incorporate light which is the photon which is the carrier of light of the electromagnetic force why are they trying to connect two things which might not be connectable because they they think they have their intuition that they are related oh, wow. because gravity affects light and light curves around gravity, you know, the gravity well. So they have this hunch. So they play that with some, each other, so they, they gotta have something to do with each other. They, they have this great hunch that they're, they have something to do with each other, but they can't put it into an equation. They cannot even conceptualize it right now because if you got a particle, uh, which is quantum, you can't, there's no way you can unite it with a sheet, yeah. the continuous sheet of space time. And it's like, how do, you, how do you get those two things together conceptually different? So the only way they can do it is by saying, okay, if we consider a particle, a point in space-time, a location, an event, at a given time, given location, given, you know, just here, one, one frame in the universal movie, that's that dot. But they're not interested so much in, you know, they, they, they have this hunch that if they can, if, if you have an event at a single point, well, that sounds very quantum-like. You know, we, we can just replace that with a particle and we've got it made. Mm. But now what's the deal with the equations? That's conceptually. But now the equation, what do we do with the equation? Well, now you have to have an equation that specifies the location of that dot 
at that point in space-time, and you have to unite it with the, gen with the field equations of general relativity. But, how, but that, that's an, another monster because now you got to understand how did they come up with a spreadsheet, with, with this uh, canvas, you know, with, with a sheet of space-time, four-dimensional space-time. Well, they had these uh, Einstein's field equations. And the field equations, all they do really <laughs> is they don't describe a sheet. They don't describe a canvas. That, that's the physical interpretation. The, the uh, equations, the only thing they do is tell you, you know, a little dot, how it moves. It tells you the orbit of a dot. The, that's all it is, a mass. The itinerary of a of That's, an, of that's an all event. it is. <laughs> More or less, it's a, it's a point mass. Think of it as a point mass. And, and the reason it curves, the, the conclusion is space is curved. That's, that's the conclusion, because some argue that Einstein never said that, that space is curved. But I have doubts about that because Arthur Eddington, 1919, said space is curved and confirmed Einstein's theory. And Einstein did not say, oh, no, you're wrong. You misinterpreted me. He never said that. He said quite the contrary. He said, yeah, the, th the theory is correct. That's what he said. Can the rope hypothesis open mathematicians' minds to new equations or more correct equations? Like like once they have the structure of how, how light, a better structure of how light uh interacts with gravity, maybe they can kind of get a better idea of, of where their equations, like which which negative sign that they're adding, which can't be added because it's a rope now, okay. you know, like, like the translation from real life into mathematics might be more seamless, like they'll get the, the, the correct equations or the correct, uh, because mathematics, when you're trying to calculate <clears throat> something, you're kind of extracting information from something, but you're kind of you're 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 a mediator. You're interpreting numbers out of a physical shape or a physical motion. Uh -huh. So, if they have the correct shape or motion, do you think they can kind of make more sense in the <laughs> in the mathematical realm? For example, getting the correct equations for light and gravity or how they interact. The way I look at it, uh, there's two primary equations which I always deal with. Um, one is the speed of light, which is C equals frequency times wavelength. It's a derivation from Maxwell's equations. He had four equations, none of which are the one I mentioned. But from those, you can derive C equals uh, frequency times wavelength. And frequency times wavelength means what? That frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength. One goes up, the other guy just got to go down in order to keep the speed of light constant, okay? And, and that's the rope, uh, which I have somewhere in here. Uh, I don't know, let's see if I have a bag of tricks. Bag of tricks, I uh, put them in here, but now I lost it. <laughs> uh, no, no, these are the balls, okay, let's see. I got it in a second. Do I have it? Third one, maybe? <laughs> Magician lost. Oh, there you go. There you go. I had, usually I keep it up, but, uh, so, so there you have it. You know, frequency times wavelength. There, there you have how many? One, two, three links. Uh, let's see, put it in the center here. We have three links, right? Uh, one, two, and three, right there. There's three links, okay? Three links. And now I torque it further, okay? Very simple. And now how many do I have? I have one, two, three, four. I have four links just by torquing it greater. So the links are shorter, and because of that, I got four links. And that's your frequency times wavelength. That's the equation of a rope. That's, not, that's for light. For gravity, very simple. You've got uh, Newton. We don't need anything else other than Newton. Mass times mass divided distance squared. Uh, closer two masses are together, two objects are together, distance reduces, right? Mm. Force goes up. In this case, we call it tension, but that's fine. Uh, we just need the calculation. We're just saying, you know, these masses get come together. Why? Be, uh, what does that mean? It means that the force goes up. In this case, it's weight. Weight goes up. Uh, the closer you are to Earth, you know, two objects are to each other, the more weight they have on each other. 
you know, we have weight on the earth too. We're pulling on the earth. But you're talking about equations that we already know. I'm yeah, but I mean, it's it's like, it's that simple. It's yeah, it's but, baby stuff. But, but but to figure out, like I don't know, again, what physicists are trying to figure out nowadays with equations. Well, they've got. But, but what you'd, I'm saying you'd is, be is, surprised. Okay, but but but. <laughs> But the whole point is they're going off on tangents of unrealistic proportions. So if, for example, rope hypothesis were to become more mainstream or more accepted by mm -hmm. real mathematicians, like if, if a mathematician accepted the rope hypothesis or, or assumed it, took uh -huh. it on, on board, and tried to make equations, figure out what they're trying to figure out or calculate what they're trying to get, calculate with the rope, do you think they'll have better chances of... of uh, finding whatever they're looking for? I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. Um, how do they come up with black holes? How do they come up with dark matter? They came up through mass. They're all working on mass, at least for the uh, Higgs uh, field. Same thing, mass. It's all mass. So 99% of these so-called physicists, these mathematicians who work in the mathematical physics departments, they call themselves physicists, which they're not. They're working on stuff related to mass. And in real physics, we don't care about mass. The only mass I'm using here is two objects coming together. And yes, if they have so many number of atoms, we'll call that the unit of mass. And then in that sense, mass intervenes in an equation. But you don't need any sophisticated equation. You can do it with Newton's uh, very simple equation. The problem is, one of the, another of the problem is that, you know, they don't look at these equations anymore because they say, oh, I, I dealt with that in high school. You know, mass times mass divided by distance squared, uh, maybe C equals frequency times wavelength. They saw that in college, but like in uh, freshman, sophomore year. So they don't care about that stuff anymore. Now they're into other stuff. They say, look, we, we, we've got the rotation of the galaxy. Uh, how do we explain this? And that's when they get into these uh, variables that they pitch in there, you know, artificially by, by magic wand. And, uh, and they just put all these kilograms wherever they needed to make their equation, to make their equations match observation. In other words, they want to be able to describe what they see out there. And for every galaxy, they're going to do that. They're just going to say, okay, for this galaxy, how much, how many, how many kilograms do we need and where for it to rotate like it's rotating? And so that's what they do. And they just sprinkle all the uh, kilograms wherever they need. And they say, okay, see, now we've, we've, we're able to explain it. But you can't see the, uh, the dark matter. Well, we don't care about that, but it's there because that's the only thing that can cause that kind of uh, um, uh, effect. And so they just live with that. They say, all we need is mass. And so what's happening here is both for black holes, uh, for uh, dark matter, for Higgs field, all this stuff that they're doing, uh, even the, those people who are studying the graviton in quantum mechanics, all they're doing is just uh, uh, looking at mass. They're saying, okay, what if we have more mass? What if we have less mass? How would, that, how would the equation have to change with mass? And, and so if, if you're always thinking that there is some invisible mass out there, some invisible kilograms, from some source that you can't see, then you're always going to go on a wild goose chase. You're going to say, oh, okay, I just need more mass here, and you just tailor your equation to, to fit the description. So, so you think... But, but do we need that? I mean, if, if there is no mass, if there is another mechanism, then all their work is in vain. Okay, but that's my point. Uh, you think the rope hypothesis would effectively kill math in physics? Yeah. Completely, because you, you can do the rope with maybe three or four equations. You, I mean, what do you need from the rope? You need uh, maybe a little bit for polarization. Maybe, uh, yeah, you do need wavelength and frequency. You can do that with, uh, th these equations already exist. It's not like we're inventing new math here. The equation is there. You just have to apply it not to a wave, but to a rope. You know, uh, this, is, this is a wave, a cross-section of a wave lengthwise like that. If you cut it, that's your wave. And that's, that's what they describe with these equations. So the rope hypothesis would put all mathematicians out of a job. Yeah, kind of like that. It's uh, because you don't need sophisticated equations to uh, describe what Mother Nature does out there. It's all very simple. It's, it's all playing with blocks and kindergarten. That's what it is. And, you know, these people will never accept that it's so simple that all these years they just made it more complicated than it is. Yeah. 
you know, and they've invented so many concepts. And then the other guy came in and built upon that other concept. And again, they're building all these towers of, uh, of abstractions, one on top of the other. Yeah. They're, they're, like I always say, they hammer a, a nail in the air, and then the guy steps on it and hammers another one up above. And, and they're climbing, you know, they're, they've lost touch with the ground. They're, they're up in the air. And so do we need all that math? I guess not. I mean, what's the point of all that? Okay, um, what about technology? Is there any foreseeable technological advances the rope hypothesis may shed, shed light on? That could happen, you know, once you, if you can introduce the rope and you say, look, this is how Mother Nature does her stuff behind, you know, behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. This is what you missed all these years. This is what you were not able to see and now we made it visible for you. Oh well, yeah, some people might use that uh, notion now and say, okay, now that I understand that, how, how, how she does her trick, they might come up with some new technology. You know, that's very possible. Um, that'd, be, that'd be interesting. Yeah, uh, one of the issues is, is this, and, and I always caution against that because, you know, the, the, the inventions are all at the macro level. That's Adam abo and above. There, there is no subatomic technology. Oh, really. Radio. Yeah, okay, signals, yeah, signals, yeah, but, but the object that you're going to build, whatever you're going to construct, is going to be from atom upwards. You can't construct something with, with light, just, just light, no atoms. Yeah, 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 you, need, you need some kind of something to touch, you know, <laughs> tangible. But again, the thing that creates the signals. Yeah, know, yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe, or some form of, of energy that we're not using, like, you know, solar power, windmill, or some, some way to generate electricity, I guess, is the more tangible way of talking about energy it's possible you know I, I can't say no but uh, I think that most of the inventions that we were that we needed I think have already been invented have been discovered invented whatever you want to call it you, you uh, think we've trial and error our way to, to whatever we need we're and, very close and a little extra information won't really help us uh, whatever they come up with now is not gonna be I don't think it's going to be groundbreaking. And part of it, uh, you don't have to believe in me. <laughs> you can go out there and find out what they're really investigating. And if they're investigating how to make a table red instead of blue, that's not groundbreaking. Inventing the table was, was groundbreaking. But to say that you made it blue, you made it out of metal instead of out of wood or stone, that's not an invention. They call it an invention. It's patented. The guy gets royalties or whatever. But, but it's... Um, it's not an invention. An invention is is something you know that really you need first that you need, and second that is uh, you know that you you have this breakthrough point okay. where you say, oh, I've invented something that all of mankind just needed the bed. Well, need, I needed a bed. Need you know? is, is very relative. Yeah, it is. I, it I, is. I don't like when people use the word need. But cause... but there are there are I guess different levels of needs. You know, you, you need food obviously more than anything else. You but need then you need video games. You need video games. <laughs> different levels of need here. And uh, in other words, I, I think you need a fridge. You need a. We needed to uh, make a beer cold. We needed to make soup hot. You know, we needed all these kinds of things first. But uh, once you get that, you know, what are you going to do with the stove? What are you going to do with the fridge? Make it faster, make it wider, bigger to hold more things? I mean, what can you do well, with a fridge? We, do with rope, no, no, thing. but my point, I'm talking about technology here yeah. that, you know, once, once you um, invent something and you made that breakthrough, all you can do is improve on it. And you can call that invention because the guy goes to the patent office and says, oh, I've got a, a little valve that allows us to proceed faster or more efficiently. Yeah, great. But uh, a fridge is a fridge is a fridge. A kitchen is a kitchen is a kitchen, you know. And a bed is a bed is a bed. Once you got all these things that make our life more comfortable, the, um, the added, um, uh, you know, comfort that another invention can add to that is always, you know, the marginal advantage is, uh, you know, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Do you think the rope hypothesis is going to do anything for spiritualism? Oh, that might that might be the case. You know, here you might have uh, I don't know maybe the Buddhists or whatever, or the Hindus. They might say, "Oh, look, we always said that the universe was interconnected, that we are connected to the stars, that we are one with the universe." And in that sense, you know, I think a lot of people will look at the rope and say, "Oh, now I found a way of justifying." My Bible, my uh, you know the the Hindu books or the uh, uh, Buddhist books, the uh, uh, 
Uh, it doesn't have, you know, have to be religion, but just spiritualism in general. Yeah. Like when people talk about like feeling the universe, they can kind of understand all those that. vibrations. Yeah, they can know. feel that on, on the sense of <laughs> well, if I am connected to everything in the universe, yeah. it makes more sense. Yeah, and that's a, in that sense, I think a lot of these religions that uh, have this notion that you know the universe is us, that each one of us is connected to the universe, that have that concept. Uh, oh, they'll love the rope model because right now we have all these islands and that doesn't favor, uh, you know, the interconnectedness of the universe at all. It's one of the things I criticize about the electric universe, by the way, and that's that, you know, they build this interconnectedness with what? With discrete particles because they're relying on Bohr's qu um, quantum model of the atom, the uh, planetary model the Bohr Rutherford uh, Rutherford Bohr model. And again, when you if you if you're going to build continuous structures, you can't do it with little balls. And that's where uh, the electric universe fails to begin with. You know, they they fail strategically and and the reason for that is they never came up with the objects that underlie, you know, the atom, light and so on. They just went ahead and they said, "Oh, the universe is electric. We do it with plasma." What plasma? Quantum plasma? Quantum plasma is, you know, you lose an electron ball bead from the atom that's got left behind only a proton bowling ball. You lost the bead. So where's the interconnectedness? Where is the uh, electricity that unites one star to another? If, it, if that electricity is built with the flow of, of, of little beads. And that's where conceptually is what the electric universe fails. Well, at the, we've at the done foundations. a good like 48 minutes of really talking more politics than, than physics so I wanted to ask a few physics questions okay. that we that I, I kind of collected over over the last month or month and a half okay months that we uh, I think I'll leave now then there, there's, a, there's a lot of questions that I kind of picked up and wanted to ask but you know if you keep talking about something or if we go off on tangents I just kind of save the okay. question and so, what's the question well the first question <laughs> is uh kind of relates to the I think it's the first video of real physics which is what is an object is that yeah yeah what is an object uh, so the first question is is the universe an object no and the answer is no um, universe uh, is a word that we invent at least in the ordinary sense right ordinary speech universe we refer to matter in space that's it that's what we think when we say universe and one of the problems there, again, uh, happens with general relativity, uh, this Big Bang theory, is that you never know when they're talking about space or the particles. Assuming, you know, all, all, everything's made out of particles, right? Uh, uh, Bohr's atom, uh, stars which are independent or apparently are independent islands, planets, galaxies, everything seems to be separated from everything else. And let's assume that because that's the assumption of general relativity. But if you have this independent world that is not interconnected, right, and it all started from some kind of singularity that exploded or whatever, they have different versions of that, then the question is, you know, is uh, when we say the expansion of the universe, well, we're treating the universe as a balloon. We're saying, we're blowing this universe up and it's expanding, right? Okay, we all understand it that way. And in fact, it's drawn as a balloon that's expanding. And they say, well, it's a four-dimensional balloon. We can't show you that, but think of it as, you know, a 3D balloon that's expanding. Fine. But then they're talking about a physical object. And the question is, which one is the object? Is it the stars that are on the surface of the rubber of the balloon? Or are we talking about the rubber of the balloon? Because the rubber of the balloon is space. And the little stars that are stapled on there and are getting fatter or whatever or distance from one from each other, those are the objects. And so we have, and, and so you can also color that with atoms if you want. And so the atoms are getting farther and farther apart. We're blowing up, right? So what are we talking about? Are we talking about the little particles, the little stars, the little planets, which are all objects? Or are we talking about the rubber of the balloon, which is space? And so again, we have this well, problem. When we talk about the universe, don't we mean both? Well, that's my point. My point is that, yeah, the word universe refers to both. Re universe is equal to. Everything. <laughs> to, to make it mathematically correct, right? It's equal to matter and space. That's, that's the word universe. 
The matter part we can all deal with. We can say those are objects and we'll call them existing objects. That's the word matter. But space, what is space? And if you put it in there, if you separate it from matter, you're essentially saying, well, matter is one thing, but space is something else, whatever it is, but it's yeah. something else. Okay, so you separate it from matter. If you separate it from matter, you're, you're giving it another meaning. Otherwise, you would say the universe is just matter. Very simple. I mean, if space is made out of particles, we just talk about particles all the way. It's all particles, and we forget about these two words, space and matter, just say particles or matter. True. But if we're going to put space there in there, then when we're treating it or defining it separately or in a different way than we do with matter. But then again, if you get into general relativity, what's expanding? Is it that the particles are getting farther away from each other, or are we saying that the balloon, the rubber, is, is getting bigger, uh, wider, or expanding? And that's why we have to determine what an object is and whether universe qualifies as an object. Because well, you can't have both ways. You can't say universe is expanding. Well, what did you mean? Are you saying that the particles are getting, you know, the stars, planets, whatever, gases, are they getting farther away from each other? Or are we saying that space is expanding? Or are we saying both? And that's where the problem is. What do you call the universe? Space and matter, no problem. I have no problem with that. I'm just saying you can't treat it as an object if you're going to include space, which is nothing, and say that nothing is expanding. That's where we have the problem. Wait, what do you mean space and matter? Yeah, because if you have space and matter, you're saying, what is space? Space is nothing. There is no object called space because space has no border. Space is that which has no shape, period. Whereas matter is that which has shape. In other words, the, the components of matter, all these stars, atoms, whatever garbage we have out there, uh, we'll call that matter, that whole shebang, we'll call it matter. So we have matter on the one hand, which are the tangible things out there, the ones that have shape and so on, the ones that interact, and then we have nothing, nothingness, and we'll call that space, we'll just give it a name. We can call it vacuum, we can call it nothing, we so can call it, it so emptiness, it, void, whatever we want to call so it. So doesn't it make sense to call the universe just the collective of matter instead we of talking could, about you don't have to talk about space at all correct correct so and that's you, why so that's why, why do you use space uh space you can use yeah but you you what, what do you, you need, use that's well, i use i use the word matter matter is better than universe because when you talk about universe it's very confusing you don't know if the guy is saying are you just talking about matter or are you talking about matter and space and when they say expansion of the universe, oh, now we get into a, a monster because you say, are you saying the matter is expanding, getting farther away from each other? Or are you saying space is expanding, like yeah. a, like if it's a standalone balloon? Yeah, like the edges of space keep going further and further. Right, and, and then we have a problem because now they're treating space as a physical object. And if, it, if space is a physical object, we have a contradiction because then we don't need to specify matter and space. We just say matter. Because space would be part of that matter. It's made out of particles. We're done. You know, it's all particles. There's nothing. There's no such thing as nothing or nothingness. What is the largest object in the universe? Uh, God. I don't know. God is pretty large. You know, he's no. Uh, I would think a galaxy is probably the bi biggest unit that you might see out there. If you consider a galaxy a unit, right? As if you treat it as an object. Remember, if you say galaxy you're talking about all the stars that comprise it but you're not looking at the individual group. component yeah, you're, you're just tra saying galaxy and you call that big object that you can see from afar you call that object a galaxy i would say that's the biggest object but then why can't you call the collective matter of everything the object no because because see it's like a table in physics if i point and say table you say, well, a table is made out of atoms. I mean, let me get my microscope and we look and say, oh, look, all these little atoms. Oh, but I thought object is that which has shape. No, yeah, yeah, but that's my point. My point is that we don't look at, it, at the components. And when you look at a galaxy, you got to treat it in the same way. If you see a, a spiral galaxy or a, or a elliptical galaxy, right? Mm -hmm. You treat it as, a, as if the object were made out of a single piece, mm -hmm. this plate. Yeah. That's just rotating out there. You're not looking at the individual things. Right, right. You, because you're treating the word galaxy, you, you, you're you referring to that whole shape that's out there. You can't say, oh, but it's made out of stars. Well, we know it's made out of stars, but we're not 
at that moment in time, when you use the word galaxy, you, you're not referring to the components of a galaxy. You're treating a galaxy as if it were made out of a single piece, as if it were a frisbee. But so by that same logic, why can't you call the collective matter in the universe an object? If you only look at matter, yes. But if you talk okay. about universe, the talking. problem with universe is that includes the word space. No, no. That's but the if, problem. If I call the universe just the collect collection. Then, you, then all you have to do is say matter. That's what I'm saying. I talk about matter, but I don't like yeah, the word but, universe. But there's a difference between matter and all the matter, isn't there? No, no. You can say matter is the matter, collection of all the objects. It just sounds like some matter. Like there's no, matter no, in this room. Well, yeah, you but can, you you can use it matter, that way. And you, when you talk about universe, you kind of implicitly talk about all of the matter that there is. That's why it's got to be clarified. Yeah, you can you can also say universe, and they say, well, it's the visible universe. And and what about what's outside our vision? You know, they have all these separate separate categories. All I'm saying is, yeah, if you're going to use you use the word matter, and if you're going to say the whole universe, you say all the matter in the universe, or you can say you know clarify that, but. When you use the word matter, then you would say the set of all objects that exist. That's essentially what matter is. But the point here is that you know you either use matter or you use the word space. Uh, using, yeah, I don't like space. Well, space. Uh, you like outer you, space. I, I prefer to use the word nothing. And we have uh, matter and nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that's, 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 I think, very clear. That's very clear. Especially if you define nothing as that which has no shape and matter as, uh, you know, uh, at least the objects that comprise matter is that which has shape. And then, yes, you can talk about uh, matter having shape. But again, uh, you know, what is the shape of matter? You would have to be outside of matter looking from a yeah, bird's eye point of view. hypothetical. Right, and the problem there is right. that y y when you get out, you are part of matter, and well, you're kind of distorting. You're not part of it, you know. That's, right, that's, yeah. It's, it's kind of like in the video game when we talk about the camera being opposed to the objects in the game. The camera doesn't really count. It's know? like God trying to see yeah. the, his creation from far away. That's all you can say. And God is not part of the universe. He says, I'm outside of it. I'm outside of time. I'm outside of matter. I'm outside of space. When they talk about the visible universe... Uh, <laughs> well, I guess the question is, is, is kind of explains it. Um, is it possible to see galaxies that are 15 billion light years away from us, uh, more than the age of the supposed the uh, supposed age of the universe? I'm not. Sure. I think we're going to get to a point. I'm not sure what the maximum uh, capacity we'll ever have. You know, remember you, we sent probes out there. Uh, you know, floating telescopes. Uh, and they can see very far, you know, and they do it. A, a lot of this is uh, done through waves and so on. It's not like, you know, Newton did or Galileo yeah. looking through a There's telescope. No seeing anything. Yeah, just, uh, not, not, now it's all done through computers and, and they look at radiation. They, they turn, they have all these filters to be able to see what kind of uh, chemical elements are there. Mm -hmm. So they say, okay, well, they, this has hydrogen, it's got. Uh, helium, you know, uh, maybe it's got sodium. So, so they collect this information, then they try to figure out, you know, what that galaxy or star, whatever they're looking at, uh, is made out of, right? And uh, and other things, why it shines, uh, how much gravity it might have. That, mm -hmm. These are this is the job of of a an astronomer. But then the question is, how far can we see? Yeah. Jose, can you see? And uh, and yeah, uh, there's gonna, I think there, we're going to get to a limit in the sense that, yeah, you have all the ropes from every uh, atom in the universe converging upon your eye, first upon the, well, wait, wait, the floating so telescope. Quick, see yeah. you when we use the word see there, we're not talking about visual. See, no, no, we're yeah, about detect. Right, just detect. Yeah. Uh, so so what we have, well, we have all the ropes connected. What's the furthest we can detect? Yeah, and uh, I don't know. Um, I'm sure that as we go along, we might de discover new tricks on how to see, detect, you know, certain things better than others. But, you know, I think we're going to reach a limit and we're very, we're probably very close to that limit uh, where, where, you know, we probably are detecting the f uh, farthest uh, um, entities in the universe that we'll ever be able to detect. I'm not sure we can detect far, farther out because now we just barely get a faint signal from some of these and we look at like, you know, yeah, almost yeah, with yeah. Uh, cataracts, you're trying to see through there and say, what is that? Well, it looks like a galaxy, question, maybe it's a star. The, the, the question originates from this sense that the universe is 13 billion years old. 
which you essentially tear down. Yeah. It has no age, so... Of course not, yeah. But that's why this question in Quora was, I guess, originally meant to ask, you know, can we see things further than the old? The universe is old? Right, and, and again, people so are trying say, to see beyond the, the, limit, the, the saying, singularity. Yeah, you're saying the limit of our detection isn't constrained by the a, the age distance, you know, light years? Yeah. Of objects is more constrained by our technology and and how far we can essentially detect period it has nothing to do with how far the things uh, how how old the signal is that's, Let, the, let's right, go, that's the right way of putting it is has nothing to do the our limits on detection aren't constrained by how old the signals are that we can pick up let's go with these people ask you know can we can we see that which is essentially so it's farther than the universe is old so Let's go with their version. Let's just go with their version for a second. They say 13.8, 13.7, whatever. Let's round off. 14 billion years ago, okay? That's when the universe started. Yeah. Can we see 15 billion years ago? Well, what, what are we going to see? Well, uh, see years ago. Well, no, no. What do you mean by that? 14 billion years ago. But what do you mean see 14 billion years ago? No, that's what, uh, okay, that's what I'm saying. The guy says, can we see something beyond the origin of time? But, but what are we talking about here? We're talking about trying to look... At not not at what came before. We got to look through the singularity. What is a singularity? It's a zero-dimensional point. And so here, assuming let, let's have the eyes of God, right? But God has got to be limited too. If we had a a, a point of origin, a point uh, the singularity. So here's God's telescope. He's looking. He's got he he can see very far, but it, it narrows down because we're getting to the end of the tape when the when the tape started. And where's the, where did the tape start? Start. It started at a singularity, at a point. And what this guy is asking, essentially, is can we now look through that point is that to what, what happened one billion years earlier? But, but wait, wait. But that's you, essentially what the guy said. Because we're talking about how far we can Yeah, but it's see, more than far. Like, like, a, like a balloon, not, not, not looking ah, into a But dog. you are. You're looking into a funnel. Because you're not looking into the past. You're that's, not what's, that's not what you're Oh, doing. yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are. No, I, you yeah, because Einstein already showed that that since light takes time to go from Andromeda to our eyes, right, it takes a, uh, millions of years to get here, yeah. then every time you see Andromeda, finally, you know, with a telescope, now you finally see Andromeda. You're seeing where it was so long ago. Millions of years ago. Okay, but then the you're question... You're looking into the past. The question is, if you're, according to them, yeah. if you see the particle on the edge of the universe, what are we to conclude? Where How... We're just saying that the half of the distance, or double, because because the light. Has well, if it reached your eye, you just take the speed of light. Yeah, yeah, but is it is it distance going and coming back? No, no, just, just coming, coming, just coming, just coming, because it just arrived at your eye. The yeah. signal arrived at your eye. But my point here is wait, that. Wait, wait, but but <laughs> I'm still trying to finish that thought. Okay, go because ahead. You're brainstorming if, out if, loud. If this, if, if, assuming we're at the center of the universe, right? Okay then the particle on the edge is six or seven billion light years away, right? If we're at the center and, and everything is floated away from us, uh, then the diameter is of, 26. No, no, it's 14. Because we're saying it's 14 uh, To the center, more. that's the radius. Oh, okay, it's the radius. Okay, diameter okay, okay, okay. to see the other guy, so, so, we'll so never assuming, see it. So assuming we're in the center, <laughs> yeah. the, dis the D this, but we can't be in the time. center. We can't be in Assuming the center. Assuming we're in the center, this uh, particle at the edge of the universe is 14 billion uh, light years away. Is that correct? Uh, if we're in the center, yeah. yeah. But so, we can't be in the center. So when so the, when we see this particle or star, or whatever, this object mm -hmm. at the edge of the universe, we're seeing something. We're seeing where it was 14 billion years ago, but now it's somewhere else. Is that what we're saying? That's the correct way of putting it? The way we have to look at it is that first we're not in the center. No, no, but I know, I know, I know, but you got to understand it because otherwise you're putting words in their mouth. Well, I'm just trying to figure out that part. Forget making it more complicated. No, no, it's going to be part. more simple. Is, Remember, is, you is, can... is the object that is on the edge of the universe... You got the whole thing wrong. You got the whole thing. Listen, what do I, listen. What do I got wrong? You can only look along the balloon. You can only look along the surface of the balloon. When you look inwards to the center, you're looking at the Big Bang, not at a star. All the stars are on the balloon. 
So if you see a star, it can't be in the center. It's got to be in the balloon, on the, on the rubber of the balloon. You're looking at a star sideways compared to uh, perpendicular to oh, the man, center. That's going to be complicated, but I think we need to do that for another time. Okay, sure. we'll, we'll continue that one the next time. That's going to be more confusing. <laughs> Okay, please give us your feedback if you want to uh, on the um, on the real physics. Okay, and we'll see you tomorrow, same time, same station. We'll see you then. Bye bye.